going to stand on this, so, so I apologize. I'm really not turning my back on you guys, um, but you may see the back of my head a little more than other people. Uh, thank you, Susan, for that introduction, and again, thank you all for coming out here. It is cold, and I'm not sure that my hands have warmed up yet. So, um, a couple of things that I do need to just mention before I start. I am going to be showing you some pictures of some brains, so if you're a little squeamish, you may want to eat really, really quickly, because it's only going to be two or three slides in. Um, and then the second thing that I just want to warn you about is I'm actually going to make you use your brain a little bit, because I'm going to show you pictures of brains, but I'm going to show you from a few different angles. So we're going to kind of try to work together to figure out what we're looking at from the different angles, okay? So here's the outline to start, because I am going to talk about cognition. I'm going to define it so that we all kind of understand what I mean by that. Then we're going to look at brains, the development of them, and then segue into the prenatal alcohol piece. So cognition is defined by people smarter than me, those people that like to post to Wikipedia, as thinking, knowing, and or perceiving. So it's a lot of what you're doing right now. All right, perceiving, uh, just to be on the same page with that, is becoming aware of or becoming conscious of. So think of it as the brain stuff that goes on consciously. All right, so there's a lot of brain stuff that goes on that you don't have to really think about that's not necessarily terribly conscious. It's still happening. This is the things that you're really sort of using brain energy and focusing on where, what you're um, using attention for. Cognitive ability is, is not static. It's not a single number that you can put on somebody from the beginning of their life to the end of their life. All right. So if you think about it, you don't expect a one-year-old is going to behave anything like a 20-year-old, and you don't expect a teenager is going to be able to behave like a 50-year-old. All right. The brain is changing. Cognitive ability is changing. Nutrition play, can play a big role in cognitive ability, both in terms of if you have poor nutrition early, either prenatally or in the early uh, stages of life development, your brain may not develop as well as it could. But also in the shorter term, if you've ever noticed that if you've been on kind of a junk food binge or something, your brain may not work quite as well as those days where you actually have eaten pretty well. Um, so that would be a short-term effect on cognition. Um, and sleep is an even better example, right? If you've slept poorly, your brain can be pretty fuzzy, it can be pretty hard to get moving, it can be hard to do sort of complex math problems inside of your head. If you're sleepy, um, it can also be hard to focus on driving, so don't do that when you're really sleepy. Um, but a good night's sleep can often fix that, or in the short term, you know, something like a cup of coffee um, or some form of caffeine. So cognitive ability can change, um, and it can be measured by things like IQ tests. And there are 101 different forms of IQ tests that can all uh, try and detect different pieces of cognition because it is a pretty wide range of abilities. And what you may be tested for depends on the question that the person's asking. All right. So think of it as thinking. Okay. So here we get to the um, the brains. Hopefully it's not. It's okay. So this is a human brain, and we're looking at the right hand side. So if I turn this way, you're looking inside my head here. All right. There's oh, wow. see, where's Scott? I told you I was going to get it wrong. So there's three main pieces of the brain that you can see here. The very large piece at the top, full of these fat, kind of wormy looking things, is your cerebral cortex or cerebral cortex. I don't pronounce everything correctly. Um, down here is your cerebellum, and underneath this kind of whitish structure is the brain stem. So if we start at the bottom, the brain stem is critically important. The brain stem has the pieces of your brain that control your heart rate and control your breathing and your blood pressure and things like that. So even when you're asleep, even when you're unconscious, your brainstem is usually still functioning. 
if you are given enough drugs or you take enough drugs that you start powering your brain stem down, that's when you may need support. So you may need respiratory support. Um, and it's also what happens when people overdose. Okay, they've taken enough drug that this part of the brain is just starting to shut down and how much it works. Cerebellum here, very important for controlling and coordinating movements. Cerebral cortex is important for what we're talking about tonight. It's the thinking and the doing part of your brain. If we were to turn this around, it would be pretty much what the left side of your brain looks like. It doesn't look terribly different. Your cerebral cortex here is almost two balloons. It's actually divided in the middle, and it's going to have a bridge underneath that allows the cells on this side to talk to the cells on the other side. Um, and even though this all looks pretty similar, it's actually very specialized. And right now, you should have activity around this part of your brain. That's the part of your brain that's hearing what I'm saying. You have activity in this part of your brain. That's the part that's seeing what's going on around you. And hopefully, those of you who are awake, sorry, I'll get this, um, will have activity going on in the very front part of the brain. And that's a big piece that's involved in this cognition that I'm talking about. So if you're thinking and you're kind of trying to understand what I'm talking about or what I'm going to talk about, that part of your brain should also be active. So that's the outside, um, and the, um, the wonders of technology, you can use an MRI and you can see inside the brain. So this is looking pretty much at the middle piece of the brain, and what we have, so the eye is here, this is the nose, here's the mouth, lips, big fat tongue, all right, up here we have the skull, and underneath we have that kind of fat, wormy-looking cerebral cortex. This C-shaped structure that's white is the bridge that goes between the two halves of the cortex. Under here, which we couldn't see at all before, is a group of things that we lump together and call them subcortical structures, because then we don't have to remember all the names. And those are really important. They collect the information from the sense, our sensory abilities. Um, and they're also really important for habits. Here's the brain stem that's controlling heart rate and breathing. There's your cerebellum, which looks a little prettier on the inside than on the out. Okay? So that's what your brain looks like in the middle. And your brain is made up of a whole bunch of cells. Okay? If you take one neuron, so there's a bunch of different kinds of cells, but nerve cells do a lot of the work. And if you can grow them on a flat plate, you can see um, the wonderful structure of them. Unfortunately, ours aren't this pretty color, so you have to color them. Here we have the cell body, which is the yellow piece and that blue piece inside. The blue piece is the nucleus. It has all your DNA. So that's kind of the driver. That's got the blueprint for the cell. And that's going to kind of determine what kind of cell it is, what proteins are going to be in that cell, what other chemicals, and how active that cell is going to be. Every cell has a cell body, and most of them have a nucleus. What neurons have, what nerve cells have, are these long finger-like projections. Collectively, we call them processes. And these allow a neuron to contact and communicate with a whole bunch of other neurons. These little red spots, I don't know how well at the back it may be a little harder to see. Those little red spots are places where this particular neuron can communicate with other neurons. So it gives you an idea of just how many other cells this particular cell could talk to and how many it can interact with to form a big network. Right. So, this is audience participation time. I'm going to get you to put your hands up, right? How many cells do you think there might be in a human brain? And this is not just neurons, this is all the cells. So, here's our guesses. Who thinks there's going to be 100 million? Don't be afraid, you're going to have to pick a number. Okay, 
How about, we'll go up by a factor of 10. How about a billion? Are there a billion cells inside your brain? Yeah, somebody says yes. 10 billion? 10 billion is getting a few takers? 100 billion. Yes, there are 100 billion cells in your brain. All right. Now, when you put your hands up like this, and you go, well, this is the size of my head, and some of this is bone, and then underneath the bone, there's some fluid, right? And that's the fluid that stops your brain from smacking into your bone every time you nod in agreement or go, I don't know what she's talking about. Okay? So even smaller than all of that, that's your brain. And there's 100 billion cells in there. That's pretty complex, all right? And they're in a pretty complex pattern that all has defined parts of the brain that do specialized things and that are able to connect to other parts of the brain so that the whole thing can work together. Um, and this, these are not as tightly packed as they would be in a brain, but it's just included to show you that when you get a whole bunch of cells and they all have these processes that are crisscrossing, it kind of looks chaotic, right? And this is one of the reasons that we have such a hard time figuring out how does the brain work and what's really important. Because there's so many cells, and they all have processes going in three dimensions all over the place. Um, and they communicate a lot with the cells that are really close to them, but they can also communicate with the cells that are quite a long way away. And so we're trying really hard to understand this, to figure out how you make brains work really well. But brains don't start out that complicated. Brains actually start out in some of their, one of their earliest uh, phases of development. They're actually, it's a simple tube, right? It really is as simple as that, like the tube that's inside your roll of paper towels. That's what your brain is in very early development. And that tube is lined by a layer of cells. And one of the first things that layer of cells has to do is those cells have to divide, right? Because we have to go from a thin layer surrounding a pretty small tube to 100 billion cells to make just the brain. So those cells have to go through a lot of division. In the process of doing that, oh my gosh. So here we have a little cartoon of what a brain looks like at about five weeks. All right. So here we're looking down on the top. And then down at the bottom here, you can imagine that we've cut right through the middle and we're sort of looking into it. So there's your tube right there, and then the layers of cells around. And because this is five weeks into development, there's already been quite a bit of cell division. Once some of those cells divide, they move away, they migrate away from the center of that tube, and they start to populate and form the brain. In the process of doing that, they kind of go in different directions, and that causes the brain to bulge in places and then to start making folds. And as that becomes more and more complex, you go from something pretty simple like this to something complex like this. And so this is about five weeks. Oh, gosh. So um, three or four weeks after, you've already had a lot more cell division. Okay, you're starting to see your two hemispheres. So that's going to be the left side and the right side of your cerebral cortex. You're seeing structures for, that are going to be these subcortical regions. And then you're seeing parts, this is going to be the cerebellum, and then this is going to be the brain stem. And so if you compare this to this, you see it's bigger, it's more complex. You've got the formation of this orange piece that wasn't even there earlier as things are becoming more specialized. And all of that is going to keep happening, keep happening um, until you get to a brain that looks like this. So it's very, very complex. And sometimes things go wrong. So this is an example of something that went really quite wrong with with brain development. Um, this is a brain of a six week old. We're now looking down on the top of the head. So all we're seeing here is the left hemisphere of the cerebral cortex and the right. So this is a sick, normal, normal six week old infant. 
And here, this is the brain that came from an infant that was exposed to very, very heavy amounts of alcohol prenatally. So I hope that with what you've learned about brains and what brains look like, I hope that you can look at this and say, well, that doesn't look right. Okay. Um, for one thing, it's a lot smaller. Right? And for another... Oh, man. I'll get it. I'll get it by the end of the night. I'll get it. <laughs> Um, so it's smaller, and these worm-like structures are not as tightly packed together. So you can infer from that that maybe there aren't 100 billion cells in that brain, right? We don't know, just from looking at it, if that's a failure of the cells to divide, or if it's a, that more of the cells died. It's probably a little bit of both, certainly from the animal work we would believe it's both. Um, but certainly the brain is a lot smaller. We also see a migration defect here in this brain. As you see here on the left-hand side, see how that's kind of smooth and whitish looking? And that's because there were a whole bunch of cells that should be tucked down inside some of these folds, and they kept migrating. They didn't stop where they were supposed to stop during the brain development. So they migrated up all the way to the top of the brain and then they just kind of kept going and they went over because of course this is skull so they can't just keep going straight. So they go up and then they just started creeping out over the surface of the brain. So of course those cells can't behave normally because they're not in the right place. So if they make connections with their neighbors, their neighbors are wrong, right? And so their address is wrong and so they can't work. So clearly these are post-mortem brains. Um, you can see something similar in living kids. So again, with what we've already seen with all the MRIs, here's a normal kid. There's our wormy looking cerebral cortex, our bridge that goes underneath, subcortical structures, brain stem. It's going to be the spinal cord down here. And there's the cerebellum. Okay, so it doesn't look terribly different from the one that we just saw that was actually from an adult, right? Um, and this one, I think we all agree, we could look at that and say, well, that's, that's not right, something happened there. So again, we see that the cerebral cortex is underdeveloped. There's actually, this bridge is missing um, in this kid. So the left side of their brain can't talk to the right side of their brain because there's no bridge for communication. It's a little hard to tell, this is not a great image, so it's a little hard to tell if the subcortical structures or the brain stem um, or even the cerebellum are terribly affected. They don't look as badly affected as the cerebral cortex, um, at least to me, um, but it's a little hard to tell. And in this we also see another couple of features um, that are seen after heavy exposure to alcohol. One is that the head is smaller. Okay, well, the brain is smaller, so it's not a surprise the head is smaller. Um, so if you were to measure the circumference of the head, it would be smaller for this child than for this. And then we also see the interesting thing that the face is pretty flat, all right? So here on this side, you see, if you start kind of at the front part of the skull here, and you draw a line straight down, the nose, the mouth, the, the jaw, protrudes past where this bone is. And here in this kid, here's the eye here, here's a teeny tiny little nose and the lips are down here. But all of this is very flat. All right? And between your eyebrow and your upper lip, we call that your mid face. All right? And so you have a flattened mid face here. So. Here we're going to switch gears again and how we're looking at the brain. Now you're looking at my brain front on, okay? So here's our cerebral cortex. Here's the bridge between the two sides. Um, and under here we have some of those subcortical structures. You can't see the cerebellum or the brain stem because we're in the front part of the brain here. All right. Now, I don't know about you, when I look at these two images, if it didn't have the labels and the arrows, I'd still be scratching my head saying, they look the same, I don't know what's wrong. 
And apparently, this is a lot of what they see in the kids with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So while those earlier slides showed like really dramatic effects on the brain, this is a lot of what they see when they're working with the kids. Um, and so the, the cheat sheet here is this gray piece here is a little smaller. This is the alcohol, so it's a little bit smaller. Um, and these gray regions out here are a little thinner. Now, your brain actually looks different from mine. If we both went and got MRIs and we looked at them, we would be able to say, well, they're not the same person. But there's no way that we would be able to tell which is yours and which is mine. All right. So here, this is probably not statistically different from this. And we just know that there's a difference because they knew the history of the kids that were scanned. So it makes it hard to work with people when you've got things that are pretty subtle changes and you've got a lot of background variability in, in normal people. So, alcohol. If you are severely affected by alcohol exposure, you can be, have a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome. To get that diagnosis, you have to have facial features, growth deficits, and changes in the brain. The facial features are in that mid-face region that I told you about. For the eyes, they like to put a fancy name on it, but really it means small eyes. Okay, so narrow eyes. The nose can be small, that mid-face can be flat like we saw, the upper lip can be thin, and then the philtrum, which is that groove that sits under your nose, um, can be smooth or absent. I know everybody likes to go, well, I'm, not, I'm not checking, I'm just stretching my nose. Um, but the, you know, again, there's a wide range of what's normal, right? Some people have a pretty pronounced filter. I do. Some people don't. In and of itself, that doesn't tell you anything. But when you get this cluster, so growth deficit below the 10th percentile for height or weight or head circumference, okay, what does that mean? I'm above average for height for a, a female in the U.S. because I'm five foot five, and average is five foot four. The tenth percentile is five foot one. My mother was five foot nothing, so she's below the tenth percentile for height. Does it mean anything? No, not by itself. Um, but when you start getting a whole bunch of things together, you start thinking maybe something went wrong. Um, and so for brain changes, they can be in the structure, like we saw. They can be in the function. If you see those severe structural changes, you're going to find functional changes, which generally is behavior changes. Um, but you can certainly have behavior changes without huge differences in the structure or how the brain looks. So that last image that we looked at, there may well be behavior changes without being anything that you look and go, wow, that looks wrong. So some of the functional changes um, that parents, caregivers say are particularly problematic for people that have been exposed to alcohol include this list of things, learning, remembering, understanding and following directions. If any of you have a toddler or remember having a toddler in your house, it's all right here. Um, and it's one thing for a toddler to do it. It's a little different when you're starting to deal with, you know, a 16-year-old or a 19-year-old or a 40-year-old behaving like this. Most of these, the socializing, the emotion stuff aside, a lot of these fall under that vague and fuzzy heading of cognition. All right, so cognitive deficits are a big piece of prenatal exposure to alcohol. Uh, in the event that you don't have enough exposure to alcohol to cause this huge big cluster, you have one of the other of the spectrum disorders. I have not listed them here. This is just to remind me to say fetal alcohol syndrome is part of the spectrum. So that's the extreme end, and then it can go all the way down to any of these features if you know that the child was exposed to alcohol. So there are a bunch of different diagnoses and names. Here's why we care about the problem, and here's why we still study it, okay? Because our dirty little secret is we know what causes this, OK? 
Okay. Still today, we have somewhere between 10 and 30% of pregnant women drink alcohol. And the number varies based on who's doing the asking and how they're asking the question. It also varies depending on where you are in the country, interestingly enough. The CDC has been asking, the Centers for Disease Control has been asking questions for, well, I don't know, forever. Um, one of their studies goes back uh, and shows a graph as far back as 1990. The proportion of pregnant women who say, yes, they drank alcohol in the last 30 days before they answered the questions is consistently about 10 or 11%. So in all those years, we have not managed to convince people to not do this. So those numbers are fairly high. Our own Phil May from the NRI um, does these great studies where he goes into schools. Um, and he went into four schools in different places in the US and he asked to survey all the kids in first grade. Okay. So the ones whose parents gave permission went forward and um, he did a whole bunch of screening and tests and various things and he says somewhere between one and five percent of those first grade kids can be diagnosed with a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Okay, so somewhere between one and five percent of first graders have enough of a deficit that they could be diagnosed with this. So if we only have 10% of women who are drinking, but we've got somewhere between one and 5% of kids are affected, then your chances of having a kid that's affected is somewhere between one and 10 and one and two, which is pretty serious odds. If it were a lottery ticket, I would totally take those odds. Um, but that's, you know, that, that's a fairly high risk. And we're not able, for whatever reason, we have not been able to get the message out to people that this is not a good thing. Yeah. So it, it I'm gonna sneak back in front of my thing. So how does this compare to other parts of the world? Um, so there are nations where there's very little drinking. And if you don't have a whole lot of alcohol consumption, you don't have a whole lot of the problem. There are nations where alcohol consumption is very, very common, especially among women. Um, and their rates of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are quite high. Um, so does that, make, does that answer the question? yeah pretty much the middle of the pack not every country looks at this we don't have stats for all of it how honest do you think those women are that are taking this <laughs> test or whatever and are they going to look at it realistically or are they going to look at what they think is going to look better on paper um, so that's part of what plays into this we don't really know the CDC survey they they think it's probably pretty accurate um, because it's a phone survey, so it's completely anonymous. I can't see you, you can't see me, you don't know who I am, I'm just asking questions. And usually, my understanding of when they do that is they'll ask questions about drugs and alcohol, um, smoking, something else, and they'll ask those questions before they'll ask, are you pregnant? Um, and there's been all sorts of tests done on that. You are more likely to get a correct answer if you ask that than if you ask, are you pregnant? Um, that said, people lie. You know, when you go to your doctor for your annual checkup and they say to you, how much do you drink a week? And you say to them, oh, I have, you know, one or two drinks a week. They go, mm-hmm. And they write down one or two when they're sitting in front of you, and then they go, yeah, maybe if you, you know. So they know that, that people are not terribly honest. They know if you say, no, I've almost given up smoking, and I smoke, you know, two cigarettes a week. Then they know that you're fibbing a little. 
Um, so they try to keep that in mind. So anyway, so it's a big problem. And for some of these kids, you know, they may be on the more mild end of the behavior spectrum. And then for some of them, they can be pretty disruptive, which can make learning difficult for them. And every, so everybody else can make it very hard for a teacher. And it's also hard on the families, right? Because people are living with this. So the good news, even at those worst odds, even if it is a 50-50 chance of getting something diagnosable, it means that there's actually a 50-50 chance that you won't be affected. Okay. The bad news, we have no idea why. We know that it's a really, really, really complex equation. Okay, and this is some of the stuff that we're trying to figure out is why. Because if I know why you're not affected, maybe I can do something with these people over here to reduce the chances that they'll be affected. Right? And that's some of what we're trying to do over at the NRI, is to understand things like that. The other bad news is that we really don't have very many interventions that work. Clearly, if kids have all sorts of behavioral deficits, whatever else, they're going to see some sort of clinical person who's going to help them try and manage that, whether it's with medications or with behavior therapy or whatever, and some of those work. They don't actually typically work as well in kids that have been exposed to alcohol as other kids, um, but they do, they do try to work. Um, but it would be nice to be able to minimize. So I said it's complicated. Some of the things that modify the risk, and this can make your risk higher or lower, depending on which way you want to go on any of these factors. One of the biggest ones, of course, is the amount of alcohol and the pattern in which you drink, okay? So if you drink a lot, it's more of a problem than if you don't drink very much at all. If you don't drink all that terribly much, you drink a bottle of wine a week, all right? If you drink it in a two-hour time period, you're over the legal driving limit, regardless of how you feel, right? You are going to be over the legal driving limit with that. Um, but you're also going to have a higher blood alcohol concentration than if you have half a glass tonight, a little bit tomorrow, whatever. So the pattern of consumption matters. Um, the brain develops over a really long period of time, and different pieces of it are undergoing different kinds of development um, on different timelines. So the timing of when you drink matters, all right? A lot of people don't know when they get pregnant. They don't know exactly when they get pregnant. So telling them, oh, well, once you hit week such and such doesn't help because they have no idea when they're going to be at week whatever. We think genetics matters. We think that probably matters quite a bit. And that's both the genetics of the mom but also of the baby because those are not identical. Remember, they just, genes get in there too. Um, and interestingly, socioeconomic status seems to matter. And we think that some of the reasons that this matters is because it really plays heavily into um, some of these others, like nutritional status, right? The more uh, disposable income you have, often the better you're eating, the better your underlying health status is because you probably have health insurance and you probably use it and you can probably afford the medications and so problems get dealt with when they're little and not when they're big and so you don't have long-term, or often don't have long-term health issues. Um, and then other exposures, so smoking, both first-hand smoking and second-hand um, exposure to smoke, other drugs that you might be taking, both legal and illegal, chemical exposure, and this can be in your house from cleaning chemicals, it can be in the environment, it can be in your workplace, uh, and environmental stressors like light, lots of light, lots of noise can be kind of stressful. Um, and environmental stressors also includes uh, air pollution, believe it or not. So a lot of those can, you know, you can eat well, you can do your exercises, you can keep good health, and you're probably going to have a better outcome than if you don't do those things. So even with all of that, human beings are really, really hard to study because with the exception of identical twins, everybody's genetically different, right? You even are from your sister, it doesn't matter how much you look like her, you're still genetically different from her, at least a bit. Um, you have different environmental 
pressures, different environmental exposures you may eat differently. And even if you and I sit down together and we decide that we're going to have a drink and we drink at exactly the same time, there's a pretty good chance that our blood alcohol concentrations are going to be a little different because we're different body sizes and we're different body compositions. So, you know, how much muscle, how much fat, how much water did you drink today, blah, 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 blah. It all plays into it. So it's really hard when you're starting with, you know, a normal that looks like this, it's really hard to find some of those small changes that actually really contribute to the outcome. And so, and so I'm a big wimp. I don't do that, actually. I don't play with people. Um, so I get to work with rats. And these are our rats. These are Long Evans rats, and they're very, very sweet. So the nice thing about these is, you know, we can get a lot of them. They develop fairly quickly. Um, and we can do some of the genetic work. And we can control a lot of those factors that are really uncontrollable in a human population. So this is just sort of explaining what we did for this particular experiment. So we took pregnant rats and we gave them some alcohol. Now rats are smarter than we are and rats don't really like the taste of alcohol. So you have to trick them into eating it. And we do that by putting the alcohol in their food. So we give them a liquid diet and it's got alcohol in it. And so if they want to eat, and they do want to eat because they're pregnant and they're growing and they're hungry, um, so they eat the alcohol. They give birth. At that point, the brain of the pups is a little past halfway through a human pregnancy in terms of developmental stage, right? So that's why I say that we're giving them alcohol for the first half of pregnancy. That's the human equivalent. Starting at a time point similar to late childhood, we start giving those pups choline. Okay, what is choline? Apart from everybody's favorite nutrient over at the NRI. Um, choline is really, really important for brain development. It's an essential nutrient. You can make it, you do make it. You may not make enough of it. You can eat it. Um, it can be good. Uh, but it's very important. It's part of cell membranes. So it's hugely important, right? You're trying to build 100 billion neurons for your brain, so you need lots of things that make the cell membrane. So it's very important in early development. It's one of the chemicals that's very important for the cognition in your brain. Okay, it forms this acetylcholine. It's also needed again in adolescence when the brain, particularly the parts of the brain, that very front part of the cerebral cortex that I said is important for cognition, there's a lot of redevelopment there in teenagers. So teenagers, yes, are crazy. It's not their fault, right? Their brain is being remodeled. Some of those connections that were there go away and they're making new ones. <sighs> so, um, and just for, for interest sake, the adequate intake um, of choline for adult humans is 550 milligrams per day for men and 450 for women. Um, and you'll find it in all sorts of things, not surprisingly, a whole bunch of things that have a lot of cell membranes, so the, the muscle from various um, animals, the liver. Um, eggs, if you're going to eat it in eggs, you have to eat the yolk. The choline is in the yolk, so don't eat the egg whites and expect you're getting your choline. All right, so it's in a whole bunch of things, um, and you can look that up on the internet if you want. So in addition to giving our little rats choline, we make them use that part of their brain that's important for cognition, right? These are rats that are just kind of lying around in a cage, so we make them work. And we make them do training on a working memory test. And I call it short-term, because I think you know, people understand what short-term memory means. The scientists that study memory apparently couldn't agree on what short-term memory means, and so they decided they should change it to working memory. It's short-term memory. All right, so how do, we, how do we train a rat to use its short-term memory? Right, and the answer is you make it run around in a maze. So the first thing you do, this is a T maze because it's in the shape of a T. It's not outside, but it's the shape of a T. So the first thing you do is you train the rats that if they, they always start here, 
and when you train them that there's food here and there's food here. And it turns out rats will work pretty well for a rice crispy. One single food, one single rice crispy in each arm, and they'll work pretty hard and they'll go and they'll find it. So once they've figured out where they need to go to find a food reward, we start the test. And so we put them here and we block this one arm so the animal can only go here to get the food. And once they've done that, they get to eat it because it's a reward. They come back here. Okay, we move to this one. They come here and we hold them there for just 10 seconds. All right, because the animal has to remember for 10 seconds well, I went right last time, so I've eaten that reward, and now I need to go to the other side. Okay, and so that's the working memory piece, is you have to hold in your brain for that 10 seconds which way you went last time, so you know you go the other way next time. Okay? If any of you have ever got up from one room and said, I'm going to go to the kitchen and do something, <laughs> all right? You all know where I'm going with this. And you get there and you're like, oh. <laughs> all right, that's a failure of your working memory right there. The best thing you can do, go back to where you started and it will come right back. It's very weird. So anyway, so that's a working memory test. And what we do is we have them do this for five days in a row. And the first day, they have no idea because you can't tell a rat what to do, right? They, they don't understand. So they have to just kind of figure it out. So the first day they do it, they're terrible. Um, if they're lucky, they get it right 50% of the time. Every once in a while you get one that's just really dumb. Um, but, but for the most part on the first day, 50% of the time. And then they get better day after day after day. So then that also becomes kind of long-term memory, right? Because it's like you've got to remember what the test was. So, so we're sort of testing that. So then we return them to their cages and we let them sit there for three weeks and we test them on something oh, something more complex, which is a test of cognitive flexibility. The best explanation that I saw for how to explain cognitive flexibility is changing mental gears. Right? So in people, this is a people test. This is, we, we don't have the rest of this. So a people test is you have a card down here and you have to match it to one of these, okay? Now it doesn't match, right? But there are features in common. So you can decide that you're gonna match it based on the number of objects here, so it would match here. You could match it on the shape, so it would match to card two, or you could match it on the color, and it would match to card four, all right? You tell the computer, the computer says you're right or you're wrong. Right? Because you have no more information than you have to match your card. That's where you start. The computer says you're right or you're wrong. If you're right, then you go, aha. If I matched it here, it's the number. All right? And so the next one comes up and you say, I'm going to match it by the number. And the computer says, you're right. And you keep doing it. If you're wrong, then you have to figure out which one of the other two features you're going to pick. And you keep doing that until you get it right. And then you carry on with that. So you do that for a little while, and then the computer says, ha ha, I tricked you, that's now wrong. All right? And you go, what do you mean that's wrong? It's totally the number, right? And so you may choose, so then it'll give you another card and you try again. So, you know, that's what they're testing. What do you do then? Do you say, no, 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 I'm sure it's right, I'm sure it's the number, and I'm gonna just keep telling it number even though it says you're wrong? Or do you go, Ha uh -huh. it's throwing me for a loop, and I'm going to try something else, all right? And so that's what this test tracks. They don't really care about how many times you get it right. They care about what you do when you get it wrong. Um, and you can do this online for yourself. It's kind of fun. So we do a rat semi-equivalent to that test. See what they do when we change the rule and they get it wrong. So what did we find? In that working memory test, that t maze? the control animals can do that within about three days. So that's pretty quick, right? They start with having no idea. On day three, they've pretty much got it figured out of what they're supposed to do. If they were exposed to alcohol, they're a little slower. So the females, it took them four days to get it right. Sorry, 
no, she's not gonna like this. The males, it took them five days. We don't really know why. So they do a little worse. Regardless of whether they had alcohol or not, if they'd been given choline, they did better. So the control animals now actually got it on day two, so really quickly. The alcohol exposed females on day three and the alcohol exposed males on day four. So everybody did a little bit better, which has been shown by other people. And you know what? They show it in humans too, that you can do often do a little bit better. But does that translate, all right? So now you've got three weeks of just sitting around, staring at the walls, talking to your siblings in this case. Um, so how did they do on the adult test? The control animals did that test exactly as we would have expected them to do. And giving them choline made no difference. So it's like, well, either that doesn't help or they were already doing as well as they possibly could have on that test and they just couldn't get better, right? The alcohol exposed animals did not do very well on the cognitive flexibility test. They get all confused, they get mad, they stop doing it, they're frustrated, <laughs> um, but you eventually get them through it uh, and they do kind of poorly. Again, the males actually did worse than the females uh, the choline in the training helped the females a little bit. And initially when we looked at the data, it looked like it helped the males a little bit. And then when we looked more carefully, we realized actually half of the males, it helped them to, them to the point that they looked like control animals. They looked like there was absolutely nothing wrong. And the other half of the males, it had no effect whatsoever. So that was kind of confusing um, and interesting. And I just want to talk briefly about, they have been using choline as an intervention in children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. The studies are not as compelling as we would have liked in terms of the outcomes. Um, one of them gave choline for like six weeks and tested the kids and really didn't find that it was particularly helpful. There was another study that gave choline longer and gave it to kids starting um, in the like four-year-old age range and found that when you gave it to those younger kids in particular and you tested them on cognitive tests, they actually did do better. They improved. So maybe choline helps a little bit, but we have to identify the kids early to be able to help them. And one of the things with the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, because there's a lot of behavior, is a lot of kids don't get identified until their school age and their behavior can become more problematic. Um, and of the ones that Phil looked at, at in his study, only 1% of all the kids that were exposed or that were able to be diagnosed had previously been, had a diagnosis. So we're missing most of the kids. They're not being diagnosed. We're not recognizing that they have a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So it's hard to intervene when you don't know who needs the help. But anyway, I apologize. I'm on tonight. So future directions and things that I'm doing. As Susan mentioned, um, I've been here at the NRI since August 1st. Uh, so I think we've finally unpacked all the boxes. Uh, but we're thinking about, okay, what are we going to do? Okay, why does choline help? And why does it seem like it only helps some and not others, okay? Does it only help cognitive function? Certainly the circuits that underlie cognitive function are, use choline, use the acetylcholine. Other behaviors don't use it, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't fix them through some weird biology that we don't understand terribly well. Um, and so some of the things that come out that the parents are frustrated with are social behaviors can be difficult, sleep. Now, sleep's an interesting one, right? Because, I don't know about you, I have insomnia. I know on days that I've slept really poorly, my brain does not work well. It's fuzzy, it's hard to pay attention. You can be a little irritable, maybe. So, if you have chronically poor sleep, maybe that's actually a part of what we're seeing in the behaviors, all right? And there are reports that these kids have disrupted sleep. So maybe if we can kind of help with that, 
but maybe some of the other stuff will settle down a bit. Um, what, can, what else can we do? Is there something else that we can do? Susan mentioned that we work with omega-3 fatty acids. We work with those separately. Those actually work quite well um, on fixing some social behaviour deficits. But what if we put the two together? Does that help? Um, what else could we do there? What's different in our 50% of our males who responded and the ones that didn't? Is there a genetic difference? I don't know. What's different in the people that somewhere between 10 and 50% of people exposed to alcohol you know, even have a diagnosable disorder? Right? Are some people protected because of their genetics? Are they better able to make choline? And so that provides them with some protection that we don't know about. These are all questions that we're thinking about and we're talking about. Um, and we're hoping that we can maybe do something about. So that's what I have to say. These are the people who actually do the work because you know, we're the ones that sit at the computers. So Jalen, Eric, and Liz. Unfortunately, they all chose to stay in Baltimore. I don't know why you would choose to stay in Baltimore when you could come here to this pretty place uh, that's lower stress and very nice. These are the people that give us money to do the work that we do. So we always say thank you to them. And just before I open for any more questions, I just want to say, so there's some great resources out there. If you're concerned about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, if you know anybody that might be interested in finding out more information, National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, NOFAS, um, started as a parent support group and is now a huge advocacy as well as doing support. Um, and on their page, they have resources that are state by state. And it turns out here in North Carolina, we have FASD in NC. Um, and again, they have a whole bunch of resources there that they can hook people up with. But one of the things that I really like about this is this picture right here. So I don't know how well you can see it. So there's a whole bunch of kids there that have fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Now, I don't know about you. To me, I look at that and I see a bunch of happy kids running around in a playground. So we focus on, and what I talked about today was, oh, all the things they can't do, all right? But you put the face on it, and these are kids, these are normal kids, out and about in the community, playing, being kids, and there's so many things that they can do, all right? And part of our job, or that I see as my job, is to try to help them get over some of those hurdles that they can't and have more time to do this and be kids. So that's what I have to say. Thank you for your attention. So how did we decide choline? Actually, to be honest, other people were working with choline first. So the story that I have heard is the person who first started working with choline in the animal models did so because she heard Steve Zysel, who runs the nutrition research, he's a, the director of our Nutrition Research Institute. Um, and he has shown and many, 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 many other people have shown that you can give choline to perfectly normal animals and to people, and you can typically give them a cognitive boost. So the woman who was doing the alcohol work decided eh, it's worth a try in animals. So on and off through the years, people have tried all sorts of nutritional interventions for models of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This is probably the one that's taken off the most, and a lot of that, I think, is because it does help with the cognitive work. Some of the other stuff, you know, you can show that it decreases inflammation um, or it may change something else, but this one seems to improve some of the behaviors. Yeah. 
You can. Yeah, 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 all of them. And there's various stuff out there with, in combination with other things. Most of them, if they're studied carefully, um, don't necessarily do terribly much, unfortunately. You know, and again, nobody really knows or understands why that might be. Um, some of them might be a dose. I think one of the things that was um, telling in our work is if you just gave choline but you didn't train them on that working memory test, nothing improved. You had to do both. So we're sort of thinking, well, maybe if you're training them and you're pushing them to really use that piece of the brain that's being remodeled, that maybe there's something about that combination that works. Yes. Yeah, you can, you can measure choline. That man right there knows probably more about it than I ever will. <laughs> yes. Yes. Are you doing a study right now, Martin? Should I plug any studies? Omega-3 fatty acids, yeah. yeah. So this, there's somebody else who's doing that combination and she's giving it to the mums at the same time as the alcohol. And that also works, right? The problem is when you have people that don't know they're pregnant, that don't want to know they're pregnant, that can't or won't take supplements, then sometimes it can be hard to get that in there. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to rewire the brain. It's not as simple as rewiring your house, which is, you know, not simple, but doable. Um, so yes, not causing the problems in the first place is always, is, is always the easiest. Um, but also trying to find, you know, what do you do with the kids that are found afterwards? There is research with choline in Alzheimer's patients, um, and it depends, you know, on how much you give and when you give it and what you test, and some of it seems like maybe it works a little bit. Um, so, you know, same sort of questions, how much do you have to give, when do you have to give it, because some of the symptoms come out after the brain damage and not before. Oh, I think you have to have a fair, go fairly well over the adequate intake to have too much. I mean, you will, or you may smell funny. It's one of the, it's one of the first outcomes, right? Um, and then longer term, yeah, you, you can cause damage um, overdosing on anything. Inositol harms membranes. Sometimes it's to make it more proprietary, right? So mine is now different to yours, and I can charge you more money. And, and you know, and sometimes there's features of it that may be helpful for something else as a part of it. anybody that's looked at the combination 
in a model of alcohol. Yes, people have, we've looked at DHA. Um, so if you give DHA at the time of alcohol, it can reduce some of the effects in animals. Um, if you give folate, you can get some improvement as well. Um, I'm not aware of anybody that specifically looked at the two together in animal models. Yes, of course, there's, there's the chance that, um, that that is the case. And in, so the gentleman who asked about the incidents, so there are people who work with cohorts of kids here in the US, but there's also people that are working with cohorts of kids in South Africa where there's a really high ch risk of drinking and in the Ukraine. Um, and those are the studies where they've kind of worked with the moms a little bit and in the Ukraine, they tested giving the moms um, prenatal vitamins or prenatal vitamins with extra choline. All right, so it's not really 100% answering your question. The prenatal vitamins seemed like they helped. The extra choline, yeah, didn't, you know, maybe a little bit more, but not really, not compelling. But the prenatal vitamins alone did seem like they were quite helpful. So, you know, if you remember I said in that big list of factors that um, can move the risk one way or the other. One was nutrition and, and vitamins can kind of play into that. So unfortunately, when you're talking to school age kids, <laughs> getting mum to remember what she did, you know, now you're talking seven, eight years ago, <laughs> can be a little tricky. Um, and, and, you know, the kids are not always with their birth mum. So that makes getting the family histories even more difficult.